All right. So it's 11 a.m. and most of you are here. So we're gonna get started, okay? All right, so welcome to the third and final session of our three-part series on COVID-19 reporting led by journalist and international trainer, Sarah Walker. Today's topic is Beyond the Tally, Critical Issues Reporting on COVID-19. Uh, this session is on the record and will be recorded. Um, and the presentation will be made available following the program. So if you have not done so already, please open up the chat box, type in your name, news outlet, region, and email address in the chat box. So before I um, hand it over to Sarah, I just wanted to once again welcome everybody, introduce myself. My name is Naomi Matos. I am the press attache here at the U.S. Embassy in Accra, Ghana. I am joined by two of my team members, Joyce Asedu and Courage Ahiyaki. Uh, Courage will be helping us out on the technical side with the PowerPoint presentation. And Joyce will be here um, to help moderate the discussion and also um, try to trouble troubleshoot any issues you guys might be having. She will have her phone near her, WhatsApp her if you feel that you cannot communicate through Zoom. And we also have two colleagues from ARS Paris. They are the reason that this is possible as a part of the ARS Paris speaker series. ARS stands for Africa Regional Services. They're based in Paris. Thank you, Odil and John Ives. They're helping on the back end. Um, so um, I would like to take a moment to introduce our speaker. I know there's a lot of familiar faces and many of you have been uh, with us the last two weeks during the series, but just in case, I'm gonna give a refresher. So Sarah um, has been working as a journalist for the written press, television, news wires, and websites. She's also an international trainer. Um, her publications have appeared in the International New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, to name a few. Um, she is a regular um, in the training circuit where she teaches courses on business investigative report, uh, reporting, including for the Thomas Reuters Foundation for Journalists in Francophone Africa. And for many of you, she is very familiar because she was in Ghana last year. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah for the last session of this series. Over to you, Sarah. Okay, well, thank you, Naomi. And thank you to all of you who are returning after the last two sessions and to those perhaps for whom this is a first time. Uh, the last uh, module in this series on reporting on COVID-19 tries to take a step back uh, from the information that we've been discussing. Certainly, this is a fast-moving story. Uh, you need to be talking regularly about how the country is handling the pandemic, uh, how many new cases there are, covering the data very closely, holding politicians to account. Uh, the news cycle is very fast, and this is a very important part of the story. But there's another part of the story uh, that we need to be thinking about in parallel, and that is during this time, this pandemic, of course, has put uh, probably every country uh, in the globe uh, under enormous pressure, uh, but not just economic pressure. It's put a lot of pressure on our democratic systems, uh, and it's put a lot of pressure on our systems of healthcare, and it's exposed the weaknesses in, in all of our systems. Uh, the good side of that, and it's also our role of journalists, is that we address those pressure points in our democratic systems and we address those pressure points in our healthcare systems in an in-depth way. Because moments like these, historic moments, similar to the Great Depression that we had in the United States, and much more severe than when we had the global financial crisis, these also can be moments to move our societies and our democracies and our economies forward. And it's really our job as journalists, one of our key roles is to help set the agenda of the debate what we should be talking about, what we need to fix. So what we're going to talk about today are those pressure points in Ghana. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we've handled some of this in the U.S. that I think can be relevant to your reporting. 
uh, on some of the issues that are going to be coming up uh, in the course of the next year. And that is the issue of whether or not there's going to be a, a new voter register, the issue of whether or not there are going to be elections in December, and how well the government uh, will implement its health infrastructure plan and its plans to support businesses uh, affected by COVID-19. What I'd like to do is share with you some of our best practices. How do we prepare to do these kinds of in-depth stories? What are some of the techniques that we use to get mobilized to cover a big story? How do we start it? What do we think about? What are the ways in which we structure our stories? We have a whole way of working uh, in the US and I would say also in the UK. When you talk about health reporting, which used to actually be called medical journalism, there's a long history of reporting. There's a tremendous depth of experience in the UK and in the United States on, on covering issues of, of health and medicine uh, that I'd like to share some of those techniques with you for you to think about as ways that you could also approach uh, these issues in your country. So let's, uh, one of the things I thought I'd do before we start is, as I have said all along, uh, the pandemic is, a, I think, probably one of the fastest moving stories that I have ever seen. Uh, it is changing so rapidly every day. For me, as someone who is doing a lot of these Zoom sessions uh, with ARS in several African countries, I spend, I would say, at least four hours a day trying to stay abreast of all the major developments of what's happening. So I thought maybe I would share what I think is the most important development since we've last talked, uh, just for you to also take a look at. And that is the tremendous global push to search for a cure for this pandemic. Because as you know, this is a new disease. The world knew nothing about it. Uh, we've had to start from scratch. But in the course since probably, I suppose, about March, when the pandemic really started to hit many countries around the globe, there's been an enormous effort to try to find uh, a vaccine or find treatments. So I thought I'd just give you a quick update about that before we move on. Today, there are more than 120 teams which are working on finding a vaccine. That's incredible. Now what we're talking about, if they're able to find a vaccine, which we may be able to find. Uh, there's more hope about finding a vaccine than the skepticism which existed. That may change, but from um, the moment, people are very hopeful. Uh, Anthony Fauci, who's our infectious diseases expert in the US, is now saying, and he said this in the past couple of days, we could possibly find a vaccine and realize possible. It is possible. It's within the realm of possibility. Come September. That's an enormous change. But as I've said before, we shouldn't get our hopes up about a vaccine. But the world's largest uh, pharmaceutical companies, there are about four or five of them, most of them are in the US or Europe, as you know, are now looking at creating a vaccine, if they can, that will cost, and keeping it low cost, at around in the West, around $10 a dose. And there are major efforts afoot to create, to take that vaccine, whichever vaccine or suite of vaccines, that might be several to meet global demand, for the developing world and for poor countries, which will be available at a very low cost, if not free of charge. So that's all been happening on the vaccine front since I last talked to you. However, in parallel, there's an another enormous research effort which is going on to find a suite of treatments because a vaccine may not be found as it hasn't been found for HIV AIDS, which I've mentioned earlier. Now they're saying <clears throat> We will probably have <clears throat> a suite of treatments that will be needed uh, for COVID patients, which will include three types of drugs, uh, some kind of an antiviral drug, uh, some kind of immune suppressing drug, and some kind of anti-inflammatory. So now there's many experiments going on to take a look at a whole suite of these three kinds of drugs, which could become sort of a cocktail, if you will, similar to what ultimately ended up being the solution for HIV age which there's never been a vaccine found for, which is still in place to this day, a suite of, a suite of medications. So <clears throat> to me, that's the biggest news which has happened since I last saw you. So let's get into uh, what's happening in Ghana, and I'm going to share with you a few techniques that we use in the U.S. Uh, for you to experiment with as you start to do your in-depth reporting. Uh, let's take a look at the next slide, if we can. So let's talk about the issue of uh, the plans to possibly do um, a new voter registry in, in the end of June. And also, of course, uh, 
the elections, which are still scheduled for December 7. Next slide. I think what we do, American journalists, when we start to think about a big story, an important story, and this is, of course, a very important story, the story of whether or not there will be a, a new register that takes place, we start with what we think are the critical issues, the critical questions that need answering. And when we do that, uh, we just brainstorm, um, sometimes with other health experts, if we have other health reporters or other political reporters, uh, after we've done our research on registers in the past, uh, best practices on registers, after we've done plenty of research, we put together what we think are the critical questions that need to be answered in our reporting and uh, in order for us to give our readers and our listeners um, the real view that they need to have. Um, and one of the things that we always ask, which is absolutely crucial, is what's, what's in it for the people who wanted to have this happen? It's not just about having a new register. Isn't that a nice thing to have? That's a very transparent thing to do. It's a way to modernize the register. This is great. But there are real political interests between, be, behind those who are for it and those who are against it. Um, take the recent example that I, I gave you uh, in the last session on Wisconsin. Um, the reason why the Democrats wanted to not have in-person voting and wanted to do mail-in ballots instead, or primarily mail-in ballots, was because that tends to increase voter participation. And increases in voter participation historically in the United States show that more people will come out and vote for Democratic candidates. Whereas the Republicans, very much wanted in-person voting because that favors an outcome towards the Republicans. So you have to ask yourself, uh, why does the ruling party think there should be an entirely new register? Really, what do they stand to gain? Um, and on the other hand, you need to also get that answer as well. Why is the political opposition against that? Sure, they're making noises saying, uh, you know, this isn't a safe environment in which to conduct a new register. And of course, they're right about that. You know, we need to make sure that the conditions are, are okay for people to be able to vote safely. Same thing for civil society. What does civil society stand to gain against not having a new register? There are real self-interests self at play here behind the rhetoric of what they're saying publicly. And you need to get to the bottom of that. Um, what do they stand, what do groups stand to gain by having a, a, a modified register or a new register? There are reasons why they're taking these positions. They may not be saying that publicly, but you need to get to the bottom of what those are. Next slide. So these are things to think about. So how then we think about, okay, these are the critical issues, not necessarily the questions, uh, finely tuned yet, but we think these are the critical issues we really need to get to the bottom of. So to do this, you need to ask independent political analysts, as well as the members of the, of the parties involved, and a range of civil society groups across the political spectrum, across the civil society spectrum. Just because the ruling party or maybe the major spokespeople of the party or maybe the president is in favor of a new register doesn't mean that all the members of his party will see things the same way. Same thing is true of the opposition. There may be different views on this coming from different parties. And in your reporting, you need to be able to capture that whole mosaic, that whole range of, of views. Uh, and at the same time, you need to talk to people who are independent analysts, who aren't aligned, who aren't a part of the party mechanism, who come from academia, who come from think tanks who come from independent bodies, what they think of, of this issue, and what they think is at stake. Of course, I think you also need to provide some history on the history of voter registry in the country, what have been the issues, what have been the problems, what have been the lessons learned. So you need to provide also some historical context and think about where you could get that historical context in addition to the news archives that you'll be searching. Um, at the same time, I think, you know, Countries all over the world are, are grappling with these issues of whether or not to hold elections or other types of democratic processes in the middle of a pandemic. Um, th this is a, a, an issue that is very new for countries. How do we deal? We haven't, I don't think we don't think we dealt with this uh, during the 1918 Spanish flu, which is widely considered to be the last 
pandemic. That was a pandemic that took place during World War I. Um, so we don't really know what we need to do uh, to hold or not to hold these processes. For example, here in, in France right now, France is also deciding whether or not to hold its second round of municipal elections, which they were supposed to hold in March and were postponed when the country was put in lockdown. And for me, it's been very interesting to follow their process, their democratic processes, uh, how they are thinking through the process of whether or not to hold these elections in the end of June. Now, there may be other examples and other countries that are similar to Ghana that you want to take a look at who are also thinking through these issues and what are some of the best practices uh, that they're going through in, in democracies also grappling with this in, in other African countries. Next slide. Now, at the same time, you know, there's the safety, the health safety issue. It's not just what's in it for the politicians and for civil society, yes or no to do a new register, modified or new. Uh, but we need to make sure that the conditions are going to be safe to proceed and we need to explain to readers and to viewers what is that process that they are going to go through to make that decision. You need to find out in Ghana, for example, in the health ministry? Have they set up a task force or a group of scientists or epidemiologists who are studying this issue, uh, examining the data on the number of new infections and, and deaths that you have, uh, emerging outbreaks, red zones? Um, how are they involved in, 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 this, in this process? Um, and, you know, in addition to what I've already read, which is that, yes, the government is going to put in place hand sanitizer, uh, measures for self-distancing, uh, requiring masks. That's all important. But, you know, the devil is in the details. How are they going to make sure that they've got enough material on hand, enough hand sanitizer, when there's a global shortage of, of hand sanitizer? How are they going to enforce this in place? Uh, are there going to be people, uh, community health workers, for example, uh, who are going to be stationed in each uh, area where they're going to be doing the register or doing the voting, as the case may be, to make sure that these are enforced? Uh, what's going to happen if these uh, conditions are not enforced? Um, so the nitty and the gritty, you know, the details of how this is also going to come about is very important. And for example, Let's take the example of a new registry, which is now being planned for the end of June. Uh, at what point are they going to decide to actually go through with it? For example, here in France, they have a scientific committee which is studying the numbers very closely. Uh, at what point are they gonna actually decide yes or no? And what should be that window? In the case of the registry, maybe not so much, but for an election, an election, how large, how long that election cycle should be will, will be an important issue. Um, when are they going to decide uh, yes or no to, to proceed with it? And under what conditions? What is the level of the growth in new infections that they're going to be comfortable with? Uh, what are the extra measures they're going to put in place uh, in any sort of red zones, like, like Accra or, or Kamasi, for example, uh, or any new areas of, of, of outbreaks? These are important questions that need answering. I think I've just lost the presentation. Oh, can you not see it? We can see it. Oh, I can't see it. It's gone. Hmm. Um, hey, Courage, why don't you um, stop sharing and then reshare again? Yeah, reshare. Looking good. Yep. Thank you, Courage. That works. Thank you, Courage. Okay. At the same time, you know, the other issue to look at in depth is, you know, what are the reasons for a new versus a limited register and where do the different political parties stand on the reasons why there's an advantage or disadvantage to it? And from the point of the view of, uh, of, of the general public, um, why should you have a new register versus a, a limited register? What, what's really at stake here? 
in American journalism, we always ask this question. Uh, and it's a question that always has to be answered in every story that we do, which is, you know, what's at stake for democracy in the country and for voters? Um, and, and why should they care? And, and quite frankly, that is a question that we ask regularly in our reporting. What's at stake here and why should the public care? And you need to get a good answer to that question. Or, you know, uh, in, in newsrooms in the US, uh, editors will say to you, well, you really don't have a story if you can't answer those questions. So ask yourself and ask your sources repeatedly that question, what's really at stake here and why, why should people care? Next slide. So, you know, you need to ask also the questions, as I said, I think I went through this on um, a couple of slides back. You want those nitty and gritty details also from the health officials. Um, you know, how are they gonna oversee a new register or, or an election? How, how's that gonna work? Um, are they gonna hire, you know, so many health workers, for example, community health workers, uh, so that they can have one in each polling station, for example, or in each place where there's going to be the new register? Uh, you know, how, how is this going to work? Do they have enough equipment to do temperature checks of every citizen who shows up for a register or an election? Uh, do they have the money? Does the government have the money for that? If people show up without masks, are there going to be accommodations for those people who don't have masks so that they can vote? You know, the devil is in the details, as we say in American journalism. Providing all those details will show whether or not uh, the, the public should have confidence in what the government is going to be putting in place in the case of doing a new register or in, or in the case of elections. Next slide. So, you know, these are more questions. Again, we do this kind of brainstorming all the time uh, in, in the U.S., you know, um, because we ask lots of questions of our officials, you know. Are you going to do checks, you know, to ensure that these measures are being put into place? How, what are you going to do to actually monitor it? And I think also importantly, uh, is the government, if they go ahead with this new registry, and they, of course, if elections take place as well, are you going to conduct a stu study afterwards to see whether or not these processes of a registration or an election are going to spread the disease? That's an absolutely crucial question. Are they going to be studying this? Do they have some kind of a scientific committee? I'm, I'm imagining that they will. For example, uh, here in France, the, la the first round of municipal elections were held in early March, and now the government uh, had its scientists study the data, analyze the data from all the polling booths in, in France. And interestingly enough, they found that voting, even though it was right at the point where the disease was starting to grow exponentially in France, that the act of going and voting um, in France did not increase the spread of the disease, which I think is probably one of the major reasons why the country is now looking at uh, holding the second round of elections the end of June. Because if it didn't affect things during a terrible period of outbreaks in France, uh, it didn't show that it was spreading the disease. Even though I have to say, as someone who, who lives here, I don't think that a lot of, uh, a lot of the French were really respecting, um, to any extent, really the, the self-distancing rules. And none of this was even in place in the, in the, voting, in the voting booths. So it's a very interesting test point. And of course, at what point will, will a final decision be made to actually go ahead to, uh, to do a new register or, or to go ahead with elections? At what point will that decision be made? Realize that these are, you know, again, we're in sort of uncharted territory here, especially in the case of elections. Every country has uh, what they consider to be you know, a typical electoral cycle when politicians can go out and campaign. In the US, we have no rules, but in other countries, there are rules that it's a fixed period of time, like six months, for example. Well, what's going to happen with that uh, election cycle in Ghana? Are they going to shorten it? Uh, what do the politicians on both sides think of that? Uh, is that going to be fair enough, depending on what they decide to do? Uh, are they going to do that to reduce the exposure, for example, to, to people? It's because you can't have large gatherings without um, very strict self-distancing measures put into place. And all of this is going to be pretty complicated uh, in an election cycle. And these are the kinds of questions that you need to ask and get, get good answers for to make sure that these elections would be held in, in safe conditions. Again, these are just questions, you know, the kinds of critical issues that, that we think about before we, before we do stories. Uh, next slide. 
So another technique that we use, American journalists, you know, we are not experts uh, in anything. I'm not, we're not, most of us are not doctors covering uh, health issues. Uh, we're not, and we're not economists covering business issues. Uh, we learn the more we report on an issue, in this case, reporting on the pandemic, reporting on democratic processes in the middle of a, of a pandemic. Um, and, and these are critical questions that we always ask at the end of every interview of any expert who we speak to. And quite frankly, they often get us answers that we didn't get during the interview because we don't always know that to answer, ask the right questions, which is what else do I need to know about this? And who else should I talk to? And what other questions should I ask? I often find these are absolutely crucial questions. I typically ask them at, at the end after I've made my best attempt after doing plenty of research and talking to other colleagues who, who do what I do um, because they're the experts and they've listened to all of your questions. So to me, this is standard practice. We always you know, ask these questions at, at the end of, uh, of any interview. Next slide. So these same questions need to be asked, not just for the register, but on preparations for, for elections. I think I've gone through quite a bit of this. Um, hopefully, if the new register goes, goes safely, they will have learned a lot, and a lot of those lessons will be applied to the election cycle, but you must make sure that you've got good answers to these questions. Uh, next, uh, next slide. Uh, I don't know how feasible this is going to be in Ghana. Um, these are very technically complex matters to change an entire electoral system from the one that you have. Very expensive, uh, very time intensive. Uh, but I think it's worth asking the question, are there other means that they could come up with instead of you know, voting in person or, or maybe even in terms of registering, for example? Um, are they looking at other options? Uh, and if so, what are those options? Are they planning for them? Do they have the funding for them? You know, this whole range of, of questions. I think it's worth asking the answer, maybe no, but I think you need to know. And uh, also, if they do decide uh, at some point concerning elections December 7th to, uh, to postpone them, um, the big question is, of course, what is at stake uh, for democratic processes, for the running of the country, um, if elections are delayed. Uh, and that's something that you need to also ask, you know, all the members of the entire political spectrum, independent political analysts, members of civil society, uh, what, they, what they think about that. Um, and that in itself, I think that's almost an article in itself. And, and, and quite frankly, you know, it's something that you can even do uh, maybe after the whole issue of the register is, is resolved. Uh, in the run up to elections before December 7th. You know, let, let the, the public in Ghana know what is at stake if we decide not to go ahead. Okay, next slide. Also, these are constitutional issues. These are issues of rules. These are issues of parliament. Uh, you need, of course, make sure to educate yourself on what those rules are, what are, what's stated in the Constitution, is there any language and how the country should be dealing with a postponement, uh, what, what, is, what do you have in place for that? Some countries have things in place, perhaps, others don't, but what are the precedents and the processes that need to be put in place? Um, and once again, you might want to take a look at, are there examples uh, in other elections? Um, in Africa that might be comparable where they also are looking at postponing national elections. The one that comes to mind that I'm familiar with, of course, is, is Malawi, where for other reasons, um, they were originally going to go ahead with um, our new presidential election in February. And because of the pandemic, they have postponed it till July. And of course, we'll see whether or not uh, they actually do it in July, but I'm assuming it's gonna to have to depend on the evolution of the pandemic in, in Malawi. There may be other countries that might provide other interesting insights and examples of how other countries are thinking through and handling this process. It will be interesting to look at. Next slide. So again, you know, you want to make sure that you report the whole 
spectrum of independent analysts and uh, political parties across that issue. And, you know, if there's a delay, you know, what, what could happen uh, during that period of delay that's being talked about? I'm sure if they're, I'm sure they're already looking at what could happen. I'm sure that uh, the government is already looking at what does that um, postponement look like? How long should it be? Uh, what is, should it be three months? Should it be six months? Uh, I'm sure all of this is going on and is being thought about and, and talked about already uh, by the part of um, both the ruling party and, and the opposition. Next slide. So uh, before I go on to talk about health infrastructure, um, are there any questions to what I've already covered uh, on elections in the registry? Um, no questions as such, just um, a comment or two about how um, they agreed with your statement about they have to, in their reporting, communicate why this is important to the electorate. Yes, because it's not immediately obvious. You know, elections are elections, and so what they do or don't happen, and uh, they're not thinking about, you know, the self-interest on the part of other stakeholders that are going to have a very heavy voice in this process. Yeah. Okay, well, let's talk about health infrastructure then. Uh, I find that the health infrastructure plan uh, that uh, the government has put together is quite an interesting plan. It seems to touch on a lot of really key issues. Uh, I took a look, I just know the, the bare bones of it. Um, I've, you know, just sort of familiar with sort of the, the main elements of it. Um, and, you know, I look at it, of course, as, as a news reporter would, would look at it. And I think that um, as a reporter tackling it, it's a big plan and it's got many different uh, components to it. And given that we are still in the phase of the rise of infections in Ghana and in West Africa, and the situation is far from clear uh, worldwide, you know, there are more and more centers of outbreak in places like Russia and countries in Latin America, um, concerns about super spreader events in the U.S., you know, it's far from clear that we're, you know, clearly on, on the downslide. So to me, looking at all the different elements of the government's infrastructure plan, it seems to me that one should prioritize what they're going to do by looking at those parts of health infrastructure that they've pledged to do, which directly relate right now to the pandemics. To me, that, that seems to, to make sense, to track very carefully what those are. Um, so let's take a look at the next slide. So to me, the parts of the health infrastructure plan in Ghana that most directly relate to the pandemic are building more testing centers. Uh, that's directly related to being able to handle the pandemic. Constructing hospitals in areas that don't have them so that if there's an outbreak of, of the pandemic somewhere, they can handle if there's, you know, if there's an explosion of cases. Um, and I think also maybe a little bit more long term, but relates to this, perhaps it comes third, but it's still interesting, are looking at three centers to study the disease, you know, with the idea in mind to eventually create what Ghana's version would be of a center for disease control. So to me, in terms of covering the infrastructure plan, uh, these would be the areas, you know, that if, if I were, I guess, a, a reporter in Ghana right now, I would want to sort of create, there would be sort of be my top priorities in, in terms of my own news hierarchy. So, um, you know, I think that the first thing to consider is, you know, you could start right now, um, even if a hospital has not been built in, a, in your respective region where you're a reporter, uh, is, is to tell some human stories, if you could, about uh, the toll that, that is taken through a lack of testing, for example, if a testing center is going to be built there, uh, the toll which has been taken already because uh, the hospital that is available is too far away, but to tell those human stories um, of, you know, the real consequences of not having, you know, a, a hospital that you can get to within a reasonable period of time, of not being able um, to get a test uh, in, a, in a timely way. Um, so I think, you know, telling real human stories right now is one of the things you could do even before uh, a hospital or a testing center opens. Um, and then once 
a hospital or a testing center opens and you want to tell a different kind of human story, and we'll talk about what those stories look like, um, of the positive impact uh, on a life, uh, on a family, or on a community of um, a person or a family or perhaps a community that's experienced a number of um, cases of COVID um, and how they were positively affected, you know, being able to get to a hospital on time, being able to get a test quickly before the symptoms got to be too bad. Um, so, you know, those are two of the things that I would strongly suggest that you do. And we're going to talk about some best, I think, some best cases, examples of the ways in which some of the American reporters have, have done that kind of thing, you know, sort of the before, uh, you know, sort of the, the cracks in the health system in the US, we have certain cracks in, in testing and, and access to healthcare. Um, and these are also ways, I think, uh, as well, telling human stories is a very important part of the COVID story because it's a way to build compassion in a community first of all, but secondly, it's also a way to break down those barriers of people who still want to believe, and they exist everywhere in every country, that uh, the disease is a fiction. You know, it's a conspiracy, it's a hoax, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's a way to break down their, um, their resistance because uh, they're being presented with evidence they cannot, um, they can't quarrel with of the toll that it has taken on, on human lives in, in, in their own community. So it's also a way to break down uh, resistance for some people who still don't wanna wear a mask, don't wanna practice self-distancing, uh, don't wanna admit uh, what's going on. Next slide. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little homework as a part of this course. I don't think it's uh, hard homework, but I think it will be interesting for you. Um, as I said, uh, there are now, now many sources uh, that have dropped their paywalls, great news sources in the US that you can go to. Now, this comes under our toolkit of best practices as American journalists. You know, um, we are constantly studying each other's work, learning the smart questions that other journalists ask, learning the uh, way in which they tell human stories that are really very moving. What are the details of those stories? How do they put those stories together? I am listening all the time to podcasts and interviews. I am reading stories all the time, outlining, creating files of questions, uh, creating files of really moving quotes of things that people have said, um, outlining the ways in which journalists have actually structured their stories. Because there's also a, a narrative structure that goes behind those stories. So um, what I'm going to suggest that you do, this I uh, listened to this week, and I found this to be incredibly moving, and I'm hoping that you will too. It's a 30-minute podcast uh, called The Daily, uh, which the New York Times does now seven days a week since the pandemic. It used to be five times a week. Uh, and it's the story of two immigrants from Mexico who live in New Jersey. Um, they were patriarchs in their family. They lived in an apartment building where they managed to bring their relatives from a very small, very poor town from Mexico. And both of them died from COVID. And it tells the story uh, which, through the lives of these two men, shows the cracks in, in the American healthcare system uh, that have been very difficult during this pandemic and have been, I think, cracks in the system in many countries, which is the lack of enough tests for people who are showing symptoms. Uh, the lack of timely health care available to people uh, who maybe can't afford it uh, or who live too far away. And I think I would say to you, I would like you to, when you have some spare time this week, uh, download this, this link and, and listen to it. Um, it tells a story of how these two men and their lack of access to health care and how it affected not just them, but it affected their whole family who lived in this apartment building. So this is an example, I think, of telling those human stories that can break down the resistance um, and can really move people on how we really want to motivate and inspire people in our countries to take a look at our healthcare systems and do the painful work of spending the money that needs to be spent to build the hospitals, to create more tests, and to do the right thing so that no citizen should be left behind. So I would encourage you to take a look at that. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Now, uh, talking about new hospitals being built, new testing centers, and three disease centers, those of you who are the national reporters, um, part of your regular beat of covering the pandemic should be keeping uh, tabs on if the government is actually fulfilling its commitments. Have they committed to a time frame for when certain hospitals are going to be built, when certain testing centers are going to be open? Have the funding that they have been, that has been pledged for this, which is about a billion uh, in local currency, have they received all the money that they need or not? Um, and these become stories as well. Is the government actually fulfilling its promises? Uh, for local reporters in different regions, I think every time a testing center uh, is open or a hospital is open, that in itself is a story that you can cover. You can do it from the point of view of a community also, how the community is awaiting the opening of this hospital, how it's going to affect the way in which the government can manage the pandemic in a local area. But these are just sort of regular parts of your reporting on the pandemic. So if you're in a local area, take a look at, did the government commit to when a hospital or a testing center was going to be open? Have they met, have there been delays? Why are there delays? Is it about funding? If there are construction delays, why are there construction delays? So I think this also becomes a part of your regular reporting on the pandemic. Next slide. So um, any questions at all? on health infrastructure reporting. No questions as of yet. Okay, we're going to motor on into the next section. And that is, what do you do about stigmatization? Uh, we're now at a point where this pandemic is about, uh, in most of our countries, two or three months along. Uh, people who have caught the infection are now in their communities. Uh, I have to tell you that in the U.S. this is also a problem. It's not a problem uh, only in Ghana. This is a problem in, in many countries. And I uh, know a bit about this because of the work that I did on Ebola uh, and the reporting that I did in Liberia. So I thought I would just share some of my experiences um, on stigmatization of ideas. Again, <clears throat> as a part of our job, we need to try and do things that will help to reduce this, the ways in which uh, people are stigmatized. Of course, the people who are stigmatized also is not just uh, those people who are catching it, regular citizens, but also the healthcare workers who are on the front lines of this epidemic, or uh, other people who are more exposed than others in their communities because of the work that they do. Uh, so I, I think that also, uh, finding ways uh, to find stories to reduce stig uh, the stigma of COVID-19 is also another important uh, dimension to what we do as, as reporters. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so I think one of the questions you should be asking yourself um, of NGOs, maybe also of your health ministry uh, and other ministries like the Ministry of uh, Children, the Ministry of Gender, um, are there efforts going on in health NGOs uh, in particular? What kind of efforts are there going on on the ground in different parts of the country um, to try to counter the, uh, the stigmatization um, which is going on? Because there probably will be some efforts going on. Uh, when I went to Liberia, I went to Liberia for a week uh, and the job that my assignment when I went there, I went with a photographer for a week. And our job was to try to find uh, ways in which the communities, after Liberia was declared Ebola free, how were they coping with, um, with the crisis, after the crisis, the impact that it was having on its communities, what was the impact on its communities, um, and what was happening in terms of um, trying to uh, tell Liberians not to be afraid of people who uh, had been cured of, of Ebola. So I spent seven days doing nothing but reporting on this. Before I went, uh, I set up uh, interviews before I went with NGOs to find out what was going on. So I had set up a number of appointments every day in different parts of the country. I wanted to show uh, how they were coping in the city of, of uh, Monrovia, for example. I wanted to show how they were coping in farming communities. I wanted to show how uh, people who had been working in a healthcare environment um, were coping who had, had also gotten the disease uh, and, and talked to them about their experiences. And then we developed 
the whole series of, of photographs of, of these people, which I'm going to share with you. So find out, um, are there some NGOs working on this issue? Is the health ministry working on this issue? Are other ministries in Ghana working on this? Um, the ministries in your country may be working in partnership also with NGOs on this. So this is a whole effort where I think you need to do a bit of reporting to see what's, what's going on. There were a number of things going on in Liberia. And I have to think that um, there are also efforts going on in, in Ghana. Next slide. So the first thing is that you want to tell stories, human stories of people who have survived COVID-19. And in particular, you want to tell stories of doctors and, and nurses and healthcare workers. Because of, co of course, they've been, you know, the frontline workers probably the most exposed to COVID and they are really subject to a lot of stigmatization. So you want to make sure that you're finding these stories. Now, the way that you find these stories is to, you need to cultivate relationships of trust with the emergency units in your area where they have a unit set up to treat with treat COVID-19. And to find out those doctors and nurses who have had the disease and are willing to talk to you about their experiences and share their stories. So that's how it works. You know, you need to cultivate those relationships with those emergency rooms where they have been, um, where they have healthcare workers on the front lines. And then you want to interview them and tell their stories. Next slide. So Sarah, we had some comments and questions coming in surrounding the topic of stigmatization. Sure. Um, so one is uh, grappling with the fact that in Ghana, um there this is an issue right and yes. um i can't tell who this is g4 stylins but feel free to write in your name if you will <laughs> um but basically this person is saying that it's not ethically correct because this person sees many hiding their test results now to say finger pointing how can we as a media redirect the focus of reportage to en encourage voluntary testing and self-isolation? Uh, that's a different issue altogether. Um, you know, the issue of whether people get tested, I'm actually, when I'm, when I'm talking about stigmatization, I'm talking about people who get the disease, have to go to the hospital or go to a medical center to be treated and then recover from the disease and go back home. By covering these issues, it's one of the ways in which we hope through our reporting that we will encourage people to come forward who are showing symptoms to get tested. Mm -hmm. Now, I know it's a very sensitive issue and it's a very sensitive issue for people to talk about what they've gone through. But if you go through talking to NGOs, which is what I did in, uh, in Liberia, I went to uh, a number of NGOs who then identified for me, health NGOs, medical NGOs, who then identified people who would talk to me. So that's how that can work. They can identify the people who will talk to you. So for example, uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, a nurse from Emanuel Hospital in Monrovia. I talked to him because he contracted Ebola as a part of his work. Uh, Emanuel Hospital, as you might know, is the hospital where the first Ebola case was diagnosed. Um, he got very, very sick from Ebola, and he, he chose of his own volition to go back and work at Emmanuel once he was cured, which is an ama amazing case. I often just look at his photo just for inspiration. He, he still inspires me to this day, the incredible courage that he had. We talked to him and we photographed him about his experiences. Uh, so, you know, I talked to Emmanuel Hospital. They identified uh, people who would talk to me, doctors and nurses who had contracted Ebola and would talk about their experiences. So that's how you would do it. You would need to actually talk to the hospital, have them identify healthcare workers who would be willing to talk to you. Um, and they, they want to get exposure to this because they realize it's a problem. People are not uh, coming forward to be tested. They're afraid. Um, and of course, people are also afraid of those who caught the disease. And so to show that here is this guy working in a hospital, um, that this is per a perfectly safe thing to do. In itself, this picture tells, tells a story. So, you know, that's how you get, a, you get a, hopefully you help to contribute to 
encouraging people to come forward to get tested who are afraid. Next slide. Um, right, so we just had a couple more comments just to give you um, some local flavor of what's happening just breaking, I think yesterday, Kahitsu just wanted to bring this up. Um, the issue of stigmatization has been part of the key issues that the government and health authorities are trying to pay more attention to now in Ghana. In fact, I think it is the reason the leadership of parliament is trying to avoid confirming whether or not some uh, members of parliament have tested positive for COVID-19 from the ongoing voluntary testing. This is actually a developing story right now. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And then um, another comment um, for home, um, from Oheme. Uh, I am currently covering some beats on how stigma is helping fuel mental health issues in some parts of the country, especially in Obwasi, um, where residents protested the siting of isolation center caregivers are already overwhelmed. And yeah. uh, the last comment from Halfway out of Volta, health NGOs play a key role in fighting stigma, but they appear absent in Ghana's COVID-19 fight. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, but um, on the flip side, if the government is, well, there's, there's two parts to the first um, statement that was made about um, the health ministry taking stigmatization seriously. So let's deal with that and then we'll talk about members of parliament secondly. Talking about the health ministry for a moment, I would definitely follow up with the health ministry and say, that's terrific, what are you doing? What specifically are you doing? What programs are you putting into place to reduce stigmatization? I'd like to report on those programs. I'd like to interview people. I'd like to see what you're doing. So that's one part of it. Now, um, I see where you're connecting the dots between stigmatization and the members of parliament who may have tested positive. Uh, that may or may not be a connection there. That's a supposition on your part. You'd have to actually test that hypothesis. But what I can say about the members of parliament, a very difficult situation. Um, we hope that our political leaders will be courageous enough to come forward and uh, announce when they have tested positive. For example, you see, you know, not a member of parliament, but a very visible person when Prince Charles came forward. Of course, you see Boris Johnson coming forward. You see um, members of the White House staff uh, who have tested positive. This is very important, you know, that uh, people who are in government, we've seen this in, in other members of government. I think some of the top members of the health ministry in different countries have come forward to say that they have tested positive. We hope, and perhaps this is an op-ed that a journalist among you could, could write, that this is one of the most powerful things that, that a politician could do, is to have the courage to actually come forward. And it does take courage. But beyond that, I'm not quite sure um, what, we can, what we can do. Uh, and I think in some ways, uh, a member of parliament coming forward has to discuss that within the party, within the political system, to see whether or not this is something that there's actually broad political consensus for, there may or they may not be. Um, of course, you have the very powerful example, which was, uh, un un I'd have to say, inescapable of Boris Johnson, who tested positive and had to go into emergency treatment. And I think that had a very powerful effect on the British public, which at that point, I think, was a bit on the fence about where things stood in terms of the strict uh, measures that, that they needed to take. So it can be a very powerful uh, tool, but it's, they need to actually decide to come forward. Um, a little bit more of a reading, which I'm going to give you. Uh, again, you know, the paywalls have been dropped. If you want to get more inspiration on uh, wonderful stories that have done of doctors and healthcare workers on the front lines, I would also suggest that you go to this uh, link at the New Yorker archive, where you can see a whole wealth of um, stories for inspiration, which you can actually read and analyze and see certain lessons that you could maybe take uh, into your reporting. Next slide. And, and tell stories of other medical personnel. Um, it's not just the doctors and the nurses that are actually treating the COVID personnel, but there are, you know, there's a whole chain of people involved um, who are also heroes in this, who have put their lives in danger. Next slide. This is an example from Liberia of what I would say was an incredibly inspiring example to me. Uh, 
I worked uh, with a health NGO, uh, which was working in Liberia. They are the ones that worked with the most severe cases of Ebola, those that there was a great likelihood uh, that they weren't going to survive. And they had to have healthcare workers to look after them in their final days, and also to prepare them um, uh, for burial. And behind, and I went to this, this was in the bush, uh, behind this healthcare center, they had to actually create a special cemetery for the victims of Ebola. These two young women um, I interviewed were amazing. Uh, they were trained to do this work. It was very dangerous work, as you can imagine. They worked with Ebola patients all day long. Um, they had to wear an incredible amount of, uh, of uh, personal protective gear. They survived. This uh, center is no longer around. Of course, they closed it when the Ebola crisis ended. And because of the money that the two of them made uh, doing this very dangerous work, they were both able to pay to go on for university educations. Again, there are other people in the healthcare chain um, who also have put themselves on the front lines in a very courageous way and are very inspiring examples. And you will find other stories along the way of people who you can you can interview. Next slide. Um, there, as I said, and I, now that you're saying the health ministry is involved in this, I think you will find that there will be, even if the health NGOs are not involved in this, I'm hoping you will find other NGOs involved in this. And I'm going to show you um, a couple examples that I found in, uh, in Liberia. I won't show all of them, I'll just show a couple. Next slide. Uh, there was an NGO that was created by a young woman. Um, this is a scene. Uh, what she did is uh, outside of Monrovia in one of the suburbs, every Saturday morning, uh, she put together a street cleaning effort. Um, and the members of the crew were a mix of healthy members of the community, Ebola survivors, and members of local government, all working together. And it was happened to be in a very busy uh, intersection, a market area of, uh, of Monrovia. And it was a way to very visibly show the community, we politicians are putting our lives out there. We are not afraid. We healthy members of the community are not afraid. Uh, and she did this every Saturday morning, uh, which was a big market day in Monrovia. I found this just through the course of being in Liberia and asking those questions that I, I said in the beginning, which is that I had done some reporting. Uh, I think I had met with a member of the gender ministry. They had mentioned this woman to me. I heard about this project through the Ministry of, uh, of Women in, in Liberia. That's how I found out about it. By you know, continuing to ask that question, what else is going on? Who else is doing work? You know, what else do I know? We'll find you most, more sources and more information. Next slide. Um, there may be also international NGOs, I think, on the ground working on this. Perhaps there are uh, emergency treatment centers uh, of international NGOs. Um, Medicine Sans Frontieres, some of these other international NGOs, they may know. Uh, health ministry personnel. I found out about several different projects through talking to uh, members of Liberia's um, health ministry. So continuing to ask every source who you talk to, now, what else is going on to reduce stigma? Who else is working on this issue? Next slide. Uh, this is, a, again, some homework, which I'm going to ask you um, to do. Um, there was a very good uh, New Yorker podcast called 24 Hours at the Epicenter of the Pandemic. And this was... Uh, interviewing people who were on the front lines of the pandemic in New York City, which has been the heart of the pandemic in, in New York. But it was designed to show how the pandemic touched the lives of many different people in many different parts of the community. It started at midnight on one day and it went till midnight on the next. And it showed how different individual lives were affected. It showed uh, a former prisoner. It showed um, a food bank. It showed uh, a critical care physician. It showed uh, people who are, it showed an Amazon delivery man. You'll have different examples of people in Ghana who will be more so on the front lines in Ghana. And these are not examples for you. These are examples that come from the US story. The story of who is affected in Ghana will be very different. But what I am saying is you wanna pick individual lives to profile on how they were affected you can go back in time 
when the pandemic was at its height in Accra or in Kumasi, identify individuals who would have been on the front line, both in the medical uh, system, as well as people who were the most exposed, uh, who were essential workers of, of one type or another. And you could do uh, a broadcast, you could do an article, you could do many things that would show the impact on the whole community. Again, this is a way to break down barriers, break down stigma, and increase compassion for the toll that the pandemic has taken on lives of people in many different settings. The settings will be different in Ghana. These examples don't apply to Ghana. You have other examples. Next slide. And tell stories of resilience. It's not um, only about the toll that it's taken, but real examples of how people have stepped up to help those who are really suffering in this pandemic. And there will be some really wonderful stories. There were many stories that I found when I was in Liberia. I'm just gonna show you one. Uh, from Liberia. Uh, it's an example that you may, you may find. This woman uh, was in charge of a market trader association in Monrovia. Women market traders were very uh, heavily affected uh, in Liberia when they closed the borders and they couldn't get uh, produce to trade in the market. Uh, they had to feed their families. They couldn't buy produce to sell in the market, even locally, because they had no money. Um, some of them also were subject to, were uh, exposed to Ebola in the market. And this woman who was in charge of the local association was an amazing woman, a former market trader herself. She went to the, all the banks and she asked them for some bridge loans uh, to give money so that these women could continue to buy local produce so they continue, continue to feed their families. Uh, she also negotiated so that they could have short-term health policies so that uh, if they fell ill or their children, that they would be able to find health care if they contracted Ebola. You're going to find stories like that in your community as well. People really stepping forward. People step forward in a crisis. And there will be other kinds of examples. There were many of these examples in Liberia. And I'm sure there are examples of, of people on the ground doing these things as well. You know, of us pulling together during this crisis. Next slide. So tell stories of the impact of the uh, pandemic on communities, not just on individuals, but on communities. Next slide. Uh, and, and, and this is another, this as an example from Liberia, you will have different examples in, um, in the pandemic in, in Ghana, but what tended to happen, I went into the bush, uh, uh, to two villages that were both on dirt roads, uh, they had no ability, to have ambulances come through for those who contracted Ebola. Uh, both villages, villages lost half of their population during the Ebola crisis, it was terrible. What tended to happen, and this is a picture of it, is that people had to take over uh, the care of, of families. This woman, she took over the care of her sister who died of the pandemic. So you had these large extended families that were created uh, because so many people lost their lives from the pandemic. So there will be ways that you will see in your communities of how the pandemic will take a toll in some of the outbreak centers. And again, um, these are stories to try to break down um, people who want to deny that this exists, deny that, it, that it's real, and to try to build some real empathy and, and compassion of the, of the tremendous toll that the pandemic can take, even if it isn't happening in your immediate area. Next slide. Also look for stories that bust myths. You know, there are many myths about this disease. Uh, for example, um, you know, find people who, who have um, contracted COVID who are, you know, young, healthy, for example. People think that if you're, you're you know, a kid or if you're in your 20s, you're not gonna contract the disease. Well, if you find people who have contracted the disease, you know, for example, a very young, healthy, a uh, young athlete, for example, uh, in his 20s, or perhaps a, a young lawyer who, who jogs every day. You know, look for those examples of people that are rather surprising. You wouldn't expect um, it to happen to them. This again, if you have time to listen to it, was a podcast about a teenager. Uh, now we know that kids can contract a different form of COVID. They, their immune systems seem to be strong enough where they don't actually contract COVID but as they try to fight, as their immune systems try to fight off the disease, they are contracting an infl a vascular inflammation and other symptoms, which are life-threatening. And this is actually the story of one teenager uh, 
uh, that this happened to a 14 year old boy. So do stories that bust those myths and people will say, well, gee, if it can happen to that, you know, healthy young athlete, it can happen to me. So look for those stories that, you know, go against what people think are happening. It's not just a disease for people who are older or people who have uh, diabetes or people who are overweight, uh, although they statistically suffer a lot more, but it can happen to anybody, anytime. Next slide. Um, so this is one of those stories, again, you can listen to it. It's of a 26 year old woman um, who ended up being hospitalized because of coronavirus. Now, when you talk to uh, hospital emergency centers, you wanna ask them specifically that you're trying to identify people that we wouldn't expect to get the disease so that they can then talk to, find out different patients who would wanna come forward, people who've recovered, who fit different profiles than what the average person in Ghana would think would be someone who would contract the disease. Okay, next slide. So any questions about stigma before we just go into a very last piece very briefly? Um, yes, so we have um, a question from Martina. Um, it's along the same lines of that breaking story from yesterday of the MPs and some of their staff members um, being reported that they have COVID-19. Her question is, how do you deal with people around powerful people who would want to stop them from coming out publicly to declare they are infected? An example is what happened in Parliament yesterday. The, the members of Parliament told the reporters they were positive, but the, um, the speaker from, a PR from Parliament put in a statement disputing that. I think she means, um, the head of public affairs for the parliament. Martina, if I'm reading that wrong, please let me know. But that is her, that's her question. Well, that's a very interesting question. It's a really hard question, to be honest, because um, I think the only thing that we could do, we can't force these people to go on the record, unfortunately. I wish we could. Um, is to make an impassioned appeal in your editorial pages and to say, look, uh, you can have life you can have life altering circumstances in the in the country if you can have the courage to come forward um, if there are members you know who are testing positive we encourage you to come forward and and to build your arguments that show that from other countries where this has happened i think you just have to do what what, what you can to inspire them to come forward perhaps you can continue to insist as a reporter those of you who have good relationships with these MPs, what I would suggest is that you continue to ask them to come forward. Do not give up. Persist and persist and persist. Realize that any really good story for any journalist is not a story that comes easily. When we're trying to get people to tell hard truths, that's never an easy journey. I would ask you to continue to press for it. Not of the press person, but look that MP in the eye and say, you don't know what kind of positive effect you could have on this country. There are many precedents in many countries now of other leaders who have done this. Please have the courage to follow in their state, in their wake, because this has made a big difference in other countries. And cite those examples. Cite them in your editorials and cite them in your meetings with these MPs. And do not give up. Do not give up. Continue to press for it. Press for it in your editorial pages. Press for it in your interviews with MPs. But you need to be, I would say, this is really the work of those political reporters who are really close to these MPs, who have good relationships of trust, who can continue to press for it. Because you just need one to come forward for others. So keep persisting, that's what I would say. And, um, and uh, there was a conversation that kind of played out while you're uh, continuing your chat about stigmatization along the lines of the role of health NGOs. So there was an agreement that NGOs need to play a key role, but on one side, um, we have a journalist says that, but on a few occasions that I encountered some of them, it appears they have their eyes on the money. Um, and so he's looking at that as another report to uh, scrutinize health NGOs during this time and their response. And on the other side of that, we have, um, 
the viewpoint that NGOs need some money for community work and engagement, and they are availing themselves and other resources to fight stigma. A little financial support from, um, a little financial support shouldn't be too much for the government to provide. Um, at the moment, we've left the stigma fight politicians, government officials, media, and health workers, and the platform remains public events and media platforms. We need people and NGOs to go to the communities and engage with the people. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Um, well, that's very interesting. I'm unfortunately, um, for any of you who are really are into this pandemic as I am, I spend about four hours a day reading up on this. And you read the, the book, which is the most important book on any plague, which is Camus, The Plague. No pandemic really in history goes on without people trying to profit from it. Whether it's people who make hand sanitizer or it's NGOs uh, looking to get extra money for community projects, this is always a temptation. A lot of money, uh, people are, you know, it's an, urge, it's an emergency. Uh, sometimes the checks and balances aren't really being put into place like they should be to prevent people from profiting from situations, but it's going to happen. So uh, by all means, follow the money trail and see if that happens. But in parallel, also do a, a job of carefully examining uh, whether they're putting together good programs, programs that are working. What I found in Liberia that was interesting, it's rather sad, I have to say, unfortunately, during the Ebola epidemic, many of the international NGOs left the country. And so Liberia was left to its own devices during this time. That meant that local citizens had to come forward with initiatives. And what that meant was that local citizens, and I met several of them, came forward with their own money to start things up. I met a woman who put together, uh, she did an NGO that did um, dropping off homework kits to kids who had to stay home, for example. Afterwards, uh, she put together some funding to create more schools in an area that didn't have schools. Um, it's not always about funding, believe it or not. Um, but just keep digging and finding out what you can find out about what's going on. And I would really, if the health ministry is coming out and saying want to do something on this boy i would i would hold them accountable for that we need these uh, initiatives now what are you looking at doing how much funding are you putting behind it who are you going to fund what are you going to fund uh, cover both sides of the equation from the health ministry side as well as from the uh, health ngo side and and just see you have to hope that there are some good people out there who want to do good things and there will be unfortunately people looking to profit from quick money Okay, let's move on to the last section very briefly, Naomi. Unless, are there other questions? Um, there's just one interesting question. Um, can a COVID-19 patient sue a media house for publishing a story about him or her that he or she has been infected with the virus? I don't think we should be doing stories about this unless we have the permission of the people we're writing about ever. You need to get their permission before you write about them then you shouldn't have to worry about that. It's a very sensitive thing, you know? That's why I'm saying the technique that we more often use to talk to these patients is going through um, the emergency room staff, they kind of identify the patients who they think we can talk to, um, or uh, giving us the telephone numbers. And it's a very, you know, this is a very delicate thing. Or, you know, saying to the emergency room, could I please talk to those doctors and nurses and patients and see if they would be willing to come forward? You know, you need to sit down, you need to have a cup of tea, you need to have a very calm, a very human, a very caring conversation with a lot of silence and a lot of sympathy. And you may need to have more than one meeting with a potential patient or a potential nurse or doctor before you can convince them. I know in my time of covering, uh, I used to cover murder cases, um, drug deals in, uh, in inner city New York, and I used to have to sit down and talk to the family afterwards. It's a very delicate conversation to have when people are in, going through such difficult things and you need to show a lot of sympathy. And you may not be able to convince them the first time. You may need to meet with them more than once in order for you to convince them to come forward with their story. It's, I can't say that it's an easy thing, but it's very worthwhile. Okay, shall we move on, Naomi? Just a couple of minutes on structure, sure. library, and I think we'll be wrapping it up. Perfect. Okay. We have different structures that we use um, for these more in-depth stories. And I just wanna share a couple of very simple structural ideas. It's not just the reporting that you do, but how do you 
create these buckets of information. In what order do you put them? Next slide. So there's the before and the after. We talked about that, you know, profiling a community that doesn't have a hospital that's close by or profiling, a, you can do this in one story. Profiling a community that doesn't have a testing center and what the impact has been is the first half of your story and the after story. And then afterwards, what happened in that community? Or if we're talking about health infrastructure, for example, you know, identifying the problem, in this case, what problems have become the most acute during this pandemic? Probably it's a lack of enough beds, enough trained doctors and nurses, enough protective equipment, whatever the case may be, but identifying those problems in the top half of your story. And then in the bottom half of your story, well, what are the solutions? to ramping up testing, to getting more protective equipment. So it's problem, solution, or before, after. Next slide. This is an excellent article I'm gonna ask you to read. Uh, it's a very long article. It's by what I think is probably our best health reporter on the planet today, Siddhartha Mukherjee, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his reporting. He is a doctor. I put in Ghanaian, but this is the title. This is the working title for a story that you could do. What the coronavirus crisis reveals about Ghanaian medicine. In this case, it's about American medicine. But that's the working title to a piece that introduces your reporting on what's missing in health infrastructure in your country. Um, so what does he do? He talks about the American health system under pressure from the pandemic. He identifies what are those pressure points or what we call pain points? And then he outlines solutions. So this is a link to his article. I'll just show you a couple examples from his story of what I'm talking about in terms of identifying problems, outlining solutions. Next slide. So one pain point he identifies is the lack of consistent research on pandemics. And this is great. He does one paragraph that talks about that. You know. Tests, drugs, and devices and procedures, all these draw on medicine as a research program. So he goes on to detail that in one paragraph. Not enough lab research and a patient will pay the price. So you see, you see how that talks about what's at stake for, in this case, the American patient, but it could be the Ghanaian patient. So he identifies several of these in his article. Pain point, lack of consistent research on pandemics, Patients pay the price for that. So he makes the link between the problem and what's at stake. Next slide. But he talks about solutions. You know, we all, we're trying to work so quickly under such emergency conditions in every country. We're all scrambling under this pandemic everywhere. So he identifies later on in the solutions section something good that came out of something bad, which is the way that clinicians have made use of Twitter and Facebook has been a heartening development. This is a story of something that's gone right out of something that's gone very wrong. So he identifies the solutions at the end of his story when you read it. Next slide. So Ghana's COVID support scheme, you know, have all the funding pledges followed through. These are things to think about. Is a funding arriving in a timely way to the aid applicants in the business, for example? Is it enough? Are all businesses who qualify getting accepted? Are there any irregularities? The training programs, are they well designed according to experts? And what are the main complaints? I know they've put together a system of grievances. How many calls have been received? So these are some of the critical issues on your support scheme. Next slide. So you want to interview applicants about their experience into Ghana's scheme that reflect these pain points and successes. And you wanna create stories that alternate between one or more stories about individual business experiences with Ghana's COVID support scheme and the general situation. So I'll show you an example from our own pages that does that, next slide. So there's a very interesting story recently about how hospitals in New York are now starting to decide what they could do now that it looks like the peak of the epidemic is over. So, the reporter starts out and tells the experience from an individual hospital in Brooklyn. What is it like now that the pandemic is over? It's, an, it's almost this eerie experience is what the emergency department says. 
but none of us are at peace. And, you know, can we go through this again? Next slide. So the experience of one hospital. In the COVID support scheme, the experience of one business. But the next paragraph links what happens in one hospital to the bigger problem. So you go from individual experience to the general problem. You can do that's another way. Individual, general, individual, general. It's a way to tell a larger story by telling a small story as well. And the next paragraph talks about the need to shift back to providing a broad range of care is urgent. Because in some cases, hospitals have lost millions of dollars of the day because people canceled surgeries and other services. So hospitals are hurting financially because they had to change and, and devote all their care to the pandemic. So what's at stake for the entire hospital system? Next slide. And as I said, you know, you want a what's at stake, why should we care paragraph. So, you know, a recent analysis of the New York City Health Department found that more than 24,000 people died than should have because, you know, they didn't believe they were infected by the virus or because it was caused by delays in getting life-saving care. That's what's at stake. 24,000 people died who shouldn't have. That's the what's at stake paragraph in a health report. Next paragraph. Next slide. So I would say to you, you know, do what we American journalists do. I've given you a whole archive of stories. Study the structure, the way they use sources, the way they go between a personal story and a bigger story, how they put in a background and context, how they answer the why I should care question. You know, learn from these. You know, I'm learning all the time. I learn every day. I write down questions that journalists ask that I think are really smart that I hear on podcasts. I'm, I'm learning every day uh, from the very best journalists in, in my profession. Next slide. And for those who are really want to read what I think is the gold standard, you can read the book that won the Pulitzer Prize on health recently by Mukherjee, who is the reporter who I referred to who did the piece on what's wrong, what went wrong with the American health system during the pandemic. Um, because we have in the US evolved a whole genre of techniques, which we call narrative nonfiction, which is taking, uh, taking reporting, taking real life stories, but using some of the techniques of fiction to make them more engaging on topics, to make topics that we talk about that can be kind of dry and technical, more engaging to a wider public. Next slide. I would suggest to all of you, you could listen to our National Public Radio's Coronavirus Daily. That's a wonderful uh, program to see some of the best reporters reporting on the coronavirus. Again, just for their techniques, questions. Last slide. So happy reporting. I think Naomi, at this point, wanted to uh, also let you know about some free resources that will be available at this time. Um, sure, and uh, thank you so much, Sarah, for all of those um, great examples and um, focusing on um, the different reporting that has been done in Ghana and can be focused on. So as Sarah said, I'm going to share my screen right quick, and I'm going to show you a resource. So, um, what I'm showing you right now is eLibrary USA, and it is basically a online library, online resources, totally free. And usually we only provide this to our patrons of our American spaces, like whether they visit us at the American Center at the Embassy or over at the American Corner in, um, um, in Accra. Uh, but since the COVID-19 pandemic is upon us and people cannot come in and visit us, we have um, granted access to this huge database for anyone who wants it. So I just wanted to show you guys, it's called eLibrary USA. Um, you see there's a press reader um, and there's also, so you can access all newspapers in the United States and internationally. Um, there's different magazines you can um, look into. Um, and then we also have information about COVID-19. 
So I brought this up on this other tab. So you have COVID-19 related resources that could help you with your reporting. Um, we have um, a press reader full of full text US newspaper articles about COVID as well as international news link. And I'm just gonna show you what that looks like. Um, so you have, it's updated all the time of the different coronavirus reporting that's coming out with US. And like I said, this is completely free. And um, as well as newspapers that you can have access to, magazines. We also have um, JSTOR, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but it's a searchable database of uh, different journal articles on different topics. Um, and if you go to the COVID-19 resources page, if you scroll down, you see that they already uh, gave you a selection of the JSTOR resources during COVID-19. And there's ProQuest, and you have the different other authoritative resources such as CDC and WHO. Um, so this is a awesome resource that we are very happy to share with all of you. So we're going to make that available if you want. Uh, at the end of this presentation, soon I'll be putting in the chat box a link to this survey um, so that we can capture, it's very short, it's like 10 questions, it'll take you less than five minutes. Um, how, get some feedback from you guys on how you enjoyed the series, what we can do to make it better, um, anything that you found valuable. And there's also question um, number 10 is whether you'd like access to the eLibrary USA. So if you click yes, we'll use the email address that you put in here and we'll get you that information. Um, so just to let you know, it is temporary. So once COVID-19 is over, we're going to revert back to only allowing folks that come visit on American spaces. But as you can see with this global pandemic, um, it's, it's around for a little bit. So you can use it for the time being and get a lot out of it. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna put this in um, the chat area. If you guys wanna fill out that survey and opt into eLibrary USA, feel free to do so. And Joyce will also um, be sending around that link uh, via y'all's WhatsApp group so you can take it then as well. So Sarah, did you have any um, last I think comments? that's it, unless anybody has any other um, burning questions they wanna raise. We have a few minutes. Yeah, we have a few minutes, so please feel free to put it into the chat box. It can be a comment, it can be a question, you can share what you're working on in the COVID-19 related space. Um, at this moment, you can share any feedback, any follow-on programming you hope to see, um, whether from Sarah or ARS Paris, um, in terms of COVID-19 or another topic um, that relates to journalism. Um, and so while we're waiting on uh, if anyone has any additional questions. We did get a comment from, I think, Ama, even though it says Rita, but I think you're sharing an account. And I think I remember seeing the name Ama. Um, but she shared a experience um, that she had an opportunity to interview a recovered patient who his community refused to sell or be friends with him and his family because he was once tested positive and his children couldn't go out because people run as soon as they see them. Um, how do you help such a person? Um, you know, unfortunately, I, journalism can only go so far. You know, our job is to tell stories. That's what journalists do. We tell stories. And the best I think that you can do in a situation like that is to tell the best story you can on how this person suffered from the disease, recovered from the disease, and how he's living his daily life today as a way to try to break down those barriers. Um, as, as I think I mentioned, um, the problem of stigma, stigma is a growing problem, including in the US. And um, the best, that's, that's the way that we, that's the only strategy that we have is to try to tell stories to build compassion in our communities, to build understanding, to build awareness, um, to break down those barriers. So that's all that we have at our disposal. We are observers. So tell the most moving story that you can of him 
can you find, you know, yes, people are often stigmatized, but there's also another side to the story. And I'm sure that is, are there people who've actually come forward to help? Because that's often the case. Maybe you can tell the stories of the people who came forward to help him and his family, people who came and delivered meals, people who came and maybe asked if they could be of any help, people who came and maybe, uh, I don't know, um, offered some kind of assistance when, when he was ill. See if you can find the positive side to that story and tell that. And that might be interesting. If it exists, I'm not saying it does, but perhaps it does. Or perhaps the children have said something really movingly, you know, I, you know, that, you know, some kind of quote from them that, you know, would help, again, to build compassion and break down the barrier. You know, my, my daddy gets up every morning at eight o'clock and makes sure to make my breakfast. And he's got as much energy as he had when he was 30 years old. And, you know, tell the story in such a way so that people see that, you know, he's, he's recovered, he's in good health. Um, he's a, a very vital member of his community. He makes a contribution to his uh, daily work. Try to tell maybe some of the positive side of, of the story of how you know his life has gotten back to normal, um, etc. And that might be one way. Try to tell the positive side of the story. All right, great. Well, we're coming up on our time here today. Um, so I think as is our tradition, this is our third time doing this. If you guys want to be in the group photo, take yourself off of off of uh, no photo so we can see your lovely faces. And um, if you want to press, um, express your appreciation for Sarah and ARS Paris for making this happen, once we see your face, you can either give a thumbs up or you can do some claps um, just to let uh, Sarah know of your appreciation. Um, so I'm going to take a picture. All right, one, two, smile. All right, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Sarah, did you have anything else you wanted to conclude with? No, I think that's fine. I just, you know, wish you all good luck and be courageous and be persistent and tell some really moving human stories. I think that's the one thing I hope that you all do. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. We really You're appreciate welcome. you spending the time with us in the past three weeks. Thank you to ARS Paris for making this happen. And thank you to my team here in Accra um, for, you know, helping to moderate the discussion and with the PowerPoint. So we will be getting um, the recording to you. And as Sarah has done for every other presentation, her contact information should be on that very first slide. And she it has is. good. And she's graciously let us share that with you all. So I'll make sure that Joyce um, gets you that information via your WhatsApp group as well, as well as this presentation and the recording. We've also included the link to the survey. If you could take, like you like to take a five minutes to fill out, we would love it, because that way we can figure out um, if we uh, can do more follow-on programs, maybe with this group, maybe with Sarah, um, to keep the conversation going, and also getting your ideas of future programs, and we have a question in there, whether you guys would like to participate with a, a media engagement about U.S. government assistance on COVID-19 in Ghana with people like Ambassador Sullivan. So it's worth your while to fill out this survey, okay? Um, so uh, I guess with that, I will say thank you guys for taking time out of your busy schedule for the last three weeks. And we hope to create more engaging programs for you guys to enjoy. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye.